Hello, my beautiful friends. Welcome back to my channel, or if you are new here, hello. My name is Cammie, and what I do here on YouTube is I like to cover true crime cases that either no other YouTuber has covered or very few YouTubers have covered, and that is exactly what we are doing today. Today's case is one that I heard about a lot in 2005. 2005 was when Katrina hit, so between Katrina being on the front page and this case being on the front page, that was like all I could hear about. Today, we are going to be talking about the case of Natalie Holloway, which if you haven't heard this case, I'm not entirely sure how you haven't, because I think most people have. So I'm going to stop talking because this is going to be a multi-parter. This is part one of the Natalie Holloway case. Natalie Ann Holloway was born on October 21st, 1986, and was the first child born to Beth and Dave Holloway. She was born in a town called Clinton, Mississippi, which is where she grew up. And that's also where her brother Matt was born. So real quick, this is the book that I am using for most of my research, well, that I use for most of my research. And it's actually written by Dave Holloway. Beth also wrote a book, but I couldn't find it anywhere for like free online. Ugh. Hindsight, it's probably on Audible. But at the time, I didn't think about it. But I couldn't find it in my library. I couldn't find it in any of the bookstores around me. So Beth's book is written from her point of view and what she was doing during the investigation, I'm pretty sure. And this book is written on Dave's perspective from the investigation into Natalie's disappearance. Dave talks about Natalie when she was a child and he remembers her being a very happy child. He talks about how she loved riding her bike in the neighborhood. And he remembers how Natalie would wake up on Christmas morning and see the president the president. She sees George W. Bush under her tree. He remembers seeing how Natalie would wake up on Christmas morning and she would go into the living room and see the presents that he and Beth had wrapped and they had stayed up all night wrapping these presents. And he gets so excited to see her opening these presents and she loved riding on his back. I think a lot of kids do that. They use their parents as a horse and just ride on their backs. I know <laughs> I did when I was a kid. <laughs> he remembers how excited she would get to show off her dancing. And he, he remembers one story about how she got up on the coffee table and was dancing and she actually ended up tipping over the coffee table and she, she broke her arm. It reminds me of when I was little and I would go into like the doorway to the kitchen and I would put my arms like on each side and lift myself up. And I also, I broke my arm from that. And <laughs> that's just really what it reminded me of. On her first day in kindergarten, he walked her to class and he did so every single day for that whole week. And he remembers on her second week, when it was time to go on her own, she got very sad that he couldn't walk into the classroom with her. Natalie has younger sisters and they all affectionately called her sissy, which really reminds me of my own brother. That's because for the longest time, that's what he called me. Sometimes he'll still call me sissy, but he's 14 now, so not so much anymore, but sometimes he does still let it slip. Natalie was known to be a sensitive woman and everyone who knew Natalie all said how loving and how kind she was and that she was the kind of person to really just do anything for a friend. And we all know someone like that. Natalie, according to everyone that knew her, was just an all-around good kid. I tell you these stories because I want you to get a feel of who Natalie was as a person and who she was as a child. And I really want to focus on making you remember who Natalie was as Dave remembered her. Natalie was a child much like us whenever we were little. How many of us can remember riding our bikes around the neighborhood until the sun went down and our parents would yell at us to get back inside because it was getting dark? Granted, I don't remember riding my bike around the neighborhood because I'm 27 and still can't ride a bike, but everyone's got a story similar to what I have just explained. I remember, like I said, I remember getting up on the coffee table and dancing and my mom would always yell at me. She'd tell me, get down because you're gonna fall and you're gonna hurt yourself. I think everyone can see a little bit of Natalie in themselves. Or maybe, if you have children, you see a little bit of your own child in who Natalie was. Natalie was seven and Matt was five whenever their parents got a divorce. And in 1995, Dave remarried to a woman named Robin. And they moved to Jackson, Mississippi before relocating back to Clinton, Mississippi. So that way Dave could be close to his children. In 2000, Beth got remarried to a man named Jug, and Beth moved to Mountain Brook, Alabama, while Dave and Robin moved to Meridian, Mississippi. Dave and Robin ended up having two daughters of their own named Brooke and Caitlin, 
and Natalie and Matt were living with Beth and Jug. So Natalie and Matt were actually living with Beth and Jug, but they would often visit Dave and Robin as much as they could. So it sounded like the entire family had a really good relationship, even despite the divorce. They sounded like they co-parented really well together. And up until Natalie was 16, she and Matt would visit Dave super often, as much as she was able to. But once Natalie became a senior in high school, her visits kind of slowed down because she was taking all these extracurriculars because she wanted, you know, she wanted it to look good on her college applications. So because of this, Dave and Robin made sure that they would go and visit Natalie as much as they were able to. And they would even go to her football teams where she danced on her school's dance team, the Dorians. So Dave said that as Natalie got older, that they really tried to instill the values that any parent would want to instill in their children. Honesty, integrity, morality. And they also had a heavy focus on God. Dave and Robin still to this day are very devout Christians and they wanted to pass that down to Natalie. And since Natalie's disappearance, Dave has made it very clear that he and Robin heavily relied on their faith to keep them through the pain that I can't imagine any parent having to go through. When Natalie finished her senior year, her entire family was really excited about the prospect of what was next for Natalie. She had graduated with honors and a 4.5 GPA from Mountain Brook High School and had a full scholarship to the University of Alabama where she planned to be a pre-med student. In addition to her participation in dance team, she was also part of the Bible Club and the Math and Spanish Honor Societies. Natalie also worked a part-time job at a health food store and she volunteered a lot. So this girl was just all sorts of things. She was like a superstar in every single thing that she was doing. I get stressed out if I have two assignments due on my online college classes. So I can't even imagine doing all this while maintaining a 4.5 GPA. Bell. Natalie... Natalie wasn't a girl that was really interested in parties and she never got involved in drugs or alcohol while she was growing up. So she was, she was a squeaky clean kid and was overall a really sweet and good person. In February of 2005, Natalie told her parents that she wanted to go on a trip to Aruba with her graduating class. It was considered a rite of passage for a lot of kids. So that way they could celebrate all their hard work and personally, I think no one was more deserving of that celebration than Natalie. Um, Dave said that he was apprehensive about letting Natalie go because it's a foreign country. I completely understand. Like I said, it's a foreign country. It's a, it's a place that they're not familiar with. And it's a place they can't get to easily by vehicle. Or that you can't get to at all by vehicle. <laughs> and, you know, I remember having a hard time convincing my mom to let me go 30 minutes into the city for a field trip in high school. This is a completely different country, like I said, that Natalie wanted to go to. Additionally, there were going to be a lot of students there, but not a whole lot of chaperones. And when Dave and Robin saw that the trip cost $985, he was even more apprehensive because, you know, because back whenever Dave and Robin were young, I imagine you could take vacations for like probably about $100 total. So Dave told Natalie that he and Robin had talked it over and that she couldn't go on this trip or more specifically that they wouldn't pay for the trip because of the high cost. And they also didn't think that it was appropriate for a high school graduating senior to go to a foreign country with her school. But they did come up with a compromise. This compromise was that he would give her a monetary gift in the amount of half of the trip and that she could do whatever she wanted to do with it, that it was her money. If she wanted to put it towards the trip, then she could put it towards the trip. If she wanted to spend it on something else, she could spend it on something else. He didn't care. And you know, I don't think that's really a bad compromise. That's, that's a lot of money. That's like almost $500. And I think it's also pretty common for parents to do that. They'll say, okay, here's half of the trip money and you can figure out how to raise the rest of the money, which is exactly what Natalie did. She ended up, I think, saving up like her money from her part-time job so that way she could try and afford this trip on her own. She had to raise, she had to raise about like $500. Beth was also okay with Natalie going on this trip to Aruba because Natalie's stepbrother two years earlier had actually been to Aruba with his graduating class in that rite of passage. And her twin cousins would also be going on the trip with Natalie since they were in the same class. So she was like, okay, 
her stepbrother's already been and her cousins will be with her, so she'll probably be safe, even if there isn't a whole lot of chaperones. When Natalie graduated, the school held the graduation in this local university theater hall, and because of this, each student was only allowed to have eight tickets to their graduation. Dave says specifically, we were to have three of them for my wife, Robin, Natalie's grandmother, and me. That left her two sisters out, and due to the distance, I asked Natalie if she could get two more tickets for her sisters, otherwise Robin might have to stay home to take care of them. So I'm really bad at math because I have dyscalculia, but, I, so I don't quite know if this math is right, but somehow Natalie had asked all 300 of her classmates if they had any extra tickets that they weren't using. And she was able to secure two more tickets for her sister. So that's some real determination right there. And once again, when Natalie wanted something, she was determined to get it. When they got to Natalie's house the day of the graduation, they expected to just kind of go to Natalie's house, grab the tickets and leave. But instead, Natalie said that she wanted to have her sisters come upstairs so that way they could come and see her room. And while that happened, the family used the free time that they had to catch up. Dave says that they spent about 45 minutes there and he says that it was, it was a little bit awkward because, you know, small talk. <laughs> I don't like small talk. I hate small talk. It, it drains me. And I guess that's because I'm an introvert. But Dave says that it wasn't really anything that they couldn't deal with, especially since Natalie's graduation was such a big deal. Side note, my own graduation was like 10 years ago on May 14th. Every time I remember that, I get so surprised. Like, I'll pass my old high school and I'm like, oh, wow, the high schoolers, they're so much older. And then I'm like, wait a minute. No, that's not right. My graduating class also had 800 people in it. And we were like the biggest graduating class in my parish. It was an insane amount of people. Hello? So when the family finally got ready to leave, Natalie informed them that she and her friends had made plans for after graduation and that she may not see them afterwards. Her graduation had about 3,000 people watching, and once the ceremony was over, Dave realized that he hadn't actually given Natalie her gift. Remember, he was going to give her that monetary amount. So they tried to find her, which was really hard given that everyone was wearing the same caps and gowns. So he just assumed that they wouldn't see her again that day and that he could just give her her gift the next day. So they're looking all over for Natalie. And finally, Dave said, okay, we'll just leave. We'll give it to her tomorrow. It'll be fine. Robin said, no, you know, let's try one more time and see if we can find her. And it was actually then that Natalie called his phone and said she wanted to see them before she left with her friends. So they're on the phone and they're communicating and Natalie's like, okay, I'm at this landmark. And Dave's like, okay, well, I'm over here. You know how you do whatever you're trying to find, like your friends or family. So they finally figured out where the other person was and they meet up and Dave gives Natalie her check for $500 and they take a photo and Dave tells her, you know, have fun in Aruba and they left. And Natalie had ended up calling Dave again, I think that night, to thank him for the check, to thank him for his gift. So the day before that Natalie left for Aruba, she had actually spoken to Robin and she kept telling her, she's like, you know, I'm so excited to go to Aruba. You know, maybe she had just gotten two new bathing suits so that way she wouldn't have to wear one with sand in it and get chafed. That's what I do when I'm going to the beach. <laughs> we went to the beach like, at the beginning of May and I we were only gonna be on the beach for one day and I packed three bathing suits with me. So <laughs> vacation's really just an excuse to buy new clothes, even though no one in these places has seen us in our clothes that we already own. It was even more like that whenever I was a teenager. And <laughs> so I imagine Natalie was probably the same. So again, Robin tells her, you know, just make sure you be careful and don't go off with anyone. And the next day, with 124 students and seven chaperones, Natalie flew to Aruba. Now, when they got to Aruba, what it was supposed to be is that each of the chaperones had scheduled daily meetings with the students. They took their passports, they gave them their room keys, and every day the students had to check in with the chaperones at a specific time just to make sure that no one had like gotten lost or that no one had been just to make sure that all the students are doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. Natalie was actually rooming with two other girls named Liz Kane and Claire Fearman. I think that's how you say that. Because that's who she was with the night before she disappeared. So Monday, May 30th was when Natalie was set to fly home, but 
Dave got a call from Matt that afternoon that Natalie had missed her flight home. And he was told that because Natalie missed her flight home, that Beth was getting on a flight so that way she could go and look for Natalie. Because once again, Natalie was in a foreign country and she was a squeaky clean kid. So it was not at all like her to miss her flight. It She was always punctual. It just, it wasn't like Natalie at all. And she especially wouldn't miss her flight when she knew that her parents were already concerned about her going to a different country. So Dave tries to call Beth, but he got no response. And he ended up Googling hotels in Aruba and he knew that they were staying in a Holiday Inn, but he had to Google to find the specific Holiday Inn that Natalie was staying in. So he gets the number for this Holiday Inn And so one of the chaperones was in Natalie's room seeing if she would maybe come back. Plus all of her stuff was in her room. And also the chaperone still had her passport. So she couldn't have gotten home without it. So there's no way that she could have just gotten on like an, on like the wrong flight. So a person from the US Drug Enforcement Agency had said that he had made a few calls to the police because he was there on vacation. And Aruba has the same rule in the United States where you can't declare someone a missing person until it's been 24 hours, which this law is so bizarre. Okay, but technically, you don't have to wait 24 hours until you can report someone is missing. You can report someone missing within an hour. You don't have to wait 24 hours, okay? Just so y'all know. Because there's the statistic is something like within the first like six or eight hours, a kidnapped person is usually dead. So you don't have to wait 24 hours before filing a missing persons report. So as soon as Beth learns that Natalie is missing, she flew in from Birmingham on a friend's private jet, which we'll talk later about how heavily criticized that Beth was due to how she reacted. But I really do think that no matter what your opinion on this case is and what your opinion on Beth is, that this was the right thing to do. Dave scheduled a flight for 5.30 a.m. the next day. And he made this checklist of things that he needed to do. And right away, he packed his bags. And at around 10 p.m., some Mountain Brook students had told him that Natalie had last been seen leaving the bar with a nice kid who played soccer and was visiting Aruba from Holland. Some of the boys from Natalie's school also knew who she had left with because they had played poker with him the night before. So Matt calls Dave later on to tell him that Natalie's flight had been rescheduled and that she would be coming home the next day and that someone from Delta Airlines had confirmed that a female was the one who rescheduled the flight. But that ended up being the chaperone who had stayed behind to stay in Natalie's room just in case she had come back. It wasn't Natalie that did it. And the reason that she did this is because she hoped that by doing this, it would somehow make Natalie show back up. And I think at this point, everyone's just doing everything that they can to try and find Natalie because they thought that Natalie had just missed her flight, which would have been the best case scenario. So because of this, because they confirmed that a female had rescheduled the flight, they thought, oh, it must be Natalie. She must have come back home. So Dave cancels his flight but he was still kind of concerned because even though this flight had been can- had been rescheduled, no one had heard from Natalie. So Natalie hadn't called him. The school hadn't called him to let him know. And he's still really worried as any parent would be. So the next morning, Dave tried unsuccessfully to reach Beth, the Aruban police, the Holiday Inn that Natalie was staying in, and no one in Natalie's room answered the phone. So eventually he figures out, okay, Natalie's not getting on the flight and something is still wrong. Dave says that he knew in his gut that something awful had happened to Natalie, but that he still held out hope that she would show back up. Dave starts calling a bunch of family members and being like, you know, hey, this is what's going on. And every single one of the family members tried to book flights, but none of them could actually get a flight out there until the next day. His youngest brother, Todd, was actually in bankruptcy and Dave tried to convince him, you know, no, don't don't come, it's fine, but Todd insisted on going. He stayed behind and sold two of his vehicles just so that way he could afford to fly to Aruba and help look for Natalie. So her entire family loved her. Like everyone was ready to just pack up and go to Aruba to try and look for Natalie. One of Dave's other brothers, Steve, was a fireman and he had to get his job covered. So he ended up going a little bit later than the rest of the brothers to Aruba. Dave's pastor also called to pray with him for Natalie's safe return. So May 31st, 2005, they left Meridian so that way they could fly to Aruba. And the entire time, Dave is just 
full of anxiety. I can't even imagine what he's going through. I can't imagine the pain of not knowing where my child is. I'd rather have confirmation that my child or my loved one was dead than be left to wonder where they are and if they're hurt, if they're not being taken care of. And I think that's the case with a lot of people. Almost every single parent I know has said that they'd rather know that their child was dead than be left to wonder what happened to their child. So as soon as they get to Aruba, they go and they rent a car and they went to the police station where there were only four on the entire island. The entire island of Aruba and they've only got four police stations. So the first two police, the first two police stations didn't know anything about Natalie's disappearance and they were instructed to go to a third police station which was the Nord, no Ward police station. Nord is actually a pretty sizable town in Aruba and it's where West Palm Beach and California lighthouses are. It's a town known for its beaches and it's just a really beautiful place. What's really weird to me, when Dave walked into the police station, this Nord police station, and told them who he was and that his daughter was missing, the first thing that he, they asked him ended up being, how much money do you have? And this was asked by a man at the police station. And that man ended up being a man named Dennis Jacobs, who was a tech, who was a detective that was assigned to Natalie's case as soon as Beth arrived on the island. And this man, he asked a lot of questions like, what kind of values did Natalie have? And even suggested that maybe Natalie had met someone and fell in love. And that he told Dave that this kind of thing happens all the time. And that Natalie would end up showing up in a few days time and that she was just partying too hard. This man even told them to go to a local bar and have a beer. And I don't know about y'all, but after someone asked me that about my missing child and just told me to have a beer, I would have lost it. The police at the police station would have ended up arresting me for punching this man in the face. He even tells Dave, and he was so confident when he said it, that Natalie was just partying or that she was on drugs. Now keep in mind, Natalie, like I said in the beginning of the video, Natalie has never had, she's never been like a party girl. She's never been interested in alcohol or in drugs. And he tells them that it was fine and that she'd just show up and that the bar he suggested that Dave go to, Carlos and Charlie's, was the best place to find Natalie. He also questioned Dave and asked Dave why he wanted to look for Natalie when Dave asked about searching for her. I have never met this man and I don't like him. Okay, disclaimer. What I'm about to say is their words, not mine. I don't agree with this term, but it's their words and not mine. This man had also said that the police led Jug to the crack houses to look for Natalie there. Again, their words, not mine. I don't like that term. I'm just saying what they said. Apparently they had gone to look for Natalie there because they had gotten word that a lot of kids do drugs and party and that Natalie was probably there with them. Jacobs had told them that Jug was there, I guess beating up the people that he, and that he didn't want Dave to go there to stir up trouble. I don't know. This sounds weird to me. Like he said that if they believe that Natalie was in this supposed crack house, that they should call him and he would check it out. And that apparently the government controlled these crack houses to keep drug addicts off the street and away from tourist areas. Which, you know, that kind of reminds me of the theory that the government controls Skid Row in California. The way that the police handled this, or specifically the way that not only the police, but also this like detective handled talking to Dave just is so, I have no words. This is also the first time we hear about the three main suspects in Natalie's disappearance. Yaron Vandersloot, Deepak Kalpo, and Deepak's brother Satish. And that is where we will leave off on this part one. And in part two, we will talk about the three main suspects and we will talk more about the police investigation and the search for Natalie. So let me know what you think in the comments below. What do you think of how this detective handled talking to Dave? What do you think about the whole situation? I'll see y'all in my next one. Bye. Thank you.